I don't have anything. I, we can play a tune. Whenever I play, people can, you know, hear, you know, like my influences and stuff. But, you know, I also want, you know, it to sound like, you know, John Williams is playing too. So, and, you know, while well, same thing with Pete, you know, he had learned from so many other great fiddle players. And, uh, but you could always tell, you know, like that was Pete McMahon playing. Very first fiddle contest I went to at Bethel, Missouri. Uh, with you know, first fiddle contest, didn't know what to do. Uh, needed the guitar player, and so my, I'd say my mom probably uh, had asked around. You know, who's the best guitar player? Especially who's the best guitar player who can follow a kid who has only been playing for a year, and uh, so uh, that was Kenny. I remember before like before the contest and practicing because I probably had never played with a guitar player. My mom plays piano and she would always play back up for me. Still plays back up for me. Uh, but, you know, that was probably, you know, pretty wild experience for eight-year-old, you know, like playing with a guitar player for the first time and then, you know, going on stage and playing in front of a crowd directly after. Did you play back up for a lot of uh, contest fiddlers? Yeah. I used to play a lot. <laughs> Did you have a lot of winners that you played with? Oh yeah, Pete McMahon. He was the best. How often did you play with him? Uh, I started back in probably, I'm gonna say 87 or 88 playing with him and pretty well that was him. Where, where did you first meet Pete? Oh, at a fiddle contest. <laughs> I don't know where at, but yeah. You had to kind of get in with him first. And after it did, me and him hit pretty good. He always told me, he said, I made him want to play. He'd come out to the house and play some. You know, anytime I'd ask him to come out, he'd generally come out. And, but I think the feeling was kind of mutual with him and me because I, I liked playing with him. He had a lot of drive to him and he was a good old man. This is one that Pete McMahon wrote for his wife.
got to be involved with the Missouri Folk Arts Program through the apprenticeship program. I had a, he had actually came up to me at a jam session they used to have in Columbia at the Historical Society and asked if I would be interested in it. And I think I had probably pestered him enough and, you know, over the years of being at the jam sessions and the fiddle camps and stuff that maybe he saw that I was, you know, involved that at that point I was committed and uh, asked if I wanted to do that. And, you know, I'd go up there once or twice a week. My mom, my mom would drive me because I, I was 15 when I started and then I was, so I was able to drive up there the last half of it. And we'd just sit there for, you know, at least three hours, once or twice a week. And, uh, you know, he would teach me tunes, but he would also teach me about phrasing, you know, uh, you know, double stops, what, what fits, what doesn't, you know, how to, you know, play the way he did, essentially, you know. And, you know, he, pretty gruff, looming, larger-than-life figure, <laughs> you know, even at 80 years old, whenever I was taking lessons with him, and, but, you know, after he warmed up to you, he was the, you know, nicest, most, and he was always polite and everything before, but he, you know, yeah. he kind of growly, growly old man, and, you know, intimidating too, because, you know, best fiddle player in the, in the state. But, you know, we had a ton of fun, you know, and uh, it kind of got cut short because he got real sick and then we never got to finish. But we spent, you know, probably solid eight months, you know, hours every week. And, you know, I soaked up everything I could. <laughs> it still do, you know, I go through and listen to his recordings all the time and, you know, learn tunes that, you know, I'm like, oh. I didn't know he played that, and it's like, well, that's kind of weird, you know, he playing, you know, Silver Threads Among the Gold, which was a almost opera-style tune that he turned into a nice swinging two-step. Pete was always going to make another album with me, but he never did get around to it. But I did get to play at the last fiddle contest with him. What year was that? Don't know the year. What year did he die? He passed away in 2000. I think that was probably the summer of 2000 at Bethel Fiddle Camp. Fiddle Camp. They had a contest there after he played that. Did he win? I think he did. I believe he did. Uh, it was, uh, he died. In, he might have been 99. Cause he was down for a while after that. I don't know when he did die, I, mean, I couldn't remember. 2000. Yeah, but... I believe he went in the hospital in 98. That's whenever my lessons stopped, so... Yeah, he right. played, it was probably 99 was his last contest. He was pretty poorly there. For... Yeah. Get him up on stage, sit him in a chair and... Yeah, he could play. Just burn it down. <laughs> That old man could play Gray Eagle in his sleep. And that was his winning tune. He used to play Tom and Jerry some. And I used to crowd him in this. Some in it and Gray Eagle both. But as years went on, he got going down. I didn't do no more crowding. I let, I let him play. Heck of a fiddler.
say I'm a little Dixie style fiddle player because they, you know, I was always told, and, and it's pretty evident too that there's, you know, three, you know, dominant styles. You have Missouri Valley, which is north of here, you know, Little Dixie, which is the area that I live in, and then you have the Ozark, and uh, Little Dixie is just more driving, you know, not as fast as Ozark style, and you know, this is pretty rudimentary explanation of it but you know just a little more ornate and you know the Missouri Valley style is just you know more horn pipes and you know more shotishes quadrilles stuff like that and you know I'd say you know in this day and age I've you know much like Pete McMahon was or Taylor McBain or Jake Hockmeyer or Cleo Persinger that you know, influenced by a lot of other out of the region, you know, like I listen to a lot of old, old Texas fiddlers, you know, and so did those guys, you know, and then on the flip side, those guys listened to, you know, Cleo Persinger whenever he was at Weezer in the 60s, you know, Jake Hockemeyer and, you know, George Morris, and so they were influenced just as, just as much from Missouri. You know, in, you know, this part of the country, you got 63 running through an I-70. So you've got all these musicians that were traveling through, you know, all the time. So it's just, I think everybody kind of picks something up from everybody else. So pretty definitive style here in this part of Missouri. As far as backup goes, is there a Little Dixie style of playing backup or is that more Missouri style would you say? What I seen in Missouri back in the 80s it was too much three chord playing. They played too simple and there was a lot more in them tunes than they was playing. And so I didn't realize what was going on. I got out of Missouri. I went to Oklahoma, uh, Tennessee, Arkansas, and I played with the guys that really knew how to play. And I thought, well, that's what I'm hearing. And so that's what I play. But I play it my way. I play what I want to hear. I don't care if John wants to hear it or not. I'm going to play what I want to hear. Would you listen to a lot of um, recordings and players and get inspiration from them? Or how did you develop your own style of of, of backup? I probably got the biggest part of what I wanted to hear from a guy out of Texas. His name was Wild Bill Lyle. He was Nixon's helicopter pilot. That old man was the best guitar player I'd ever been around. And he kind of liked me, I think, because he'd show me things. And once in a while, I'd get to show him something. And I uh, but he, he played with all the Texas boys, Oklahoma. They played down at Mountain View at uh, Spigma when they had the contest down there. And the guy was good. And I, I listened to a lot of that recordings from that contest and stuff. And when he played, I'm, man, I wished I could do some of that stuff. Well, I probably don't do it that way, but I listened to it. Like I said, you, you got, had to get out of Missouri because these guys up here were stuck in them three chords and they couldn't get out of it. Aunt Mary's Hornpipe? Yeah, that's good too. Learned this one from Boone County fiddle player uh, Nolan. No, he was from Mexico. Right. Yep, uh, Nolan Boone, so.
mention Bethel a little bit. Mm -hmm. Let's see, it's been going on what, a little over 30 years now. Yeah. Uh, the huh? Missouri State Old Time Fiddlers Association started that back in the 80s. And let's see. About 85 or 6, I think it was. Uh, first time I went there, was, I was nine. So I went just about every year until I was too old to go. And then uh, started teaching there after after I graduated high school. And Kenny's been there just about every year since it started. Other than the first, I've since in that area, later, late 80s, I think. I'm kind of a fixture up there. What's been your experience like there? I don't know. Very tiring. Yeah, that's uh they've had some good kids come through that place. It's pretty much non stop fiddling and then dancing of an evening about eighteen hours a day. Just enough time to, you know, take a shower, take a nap and then get back up and do it again. And there is an adult a part of it too, right? Yeah, they just started that uh really, really started it this 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 year. So they had pretty good turnout and should have a really good turnout next year, hopefully. You know, I grew up as an only kid, you know, out here in the middle of nowhere in the country. Uh, you know, I've always loved music from uh, since I was a kid. And, you know, being able to be around kids my own age that had the same hobby and then get to sit across and learn from the people that I, you know, like admired so much, you know, I. We'd get to have lessons with Pete McMahon, you know, well before I started taking uh, individual lessons with him, you know, Bob Holt, uh, Dwight Lamb, uh, Niall Wilson, Vesta Johnson, which he, you know, taught there this past year or two, uh, you know, Johnny Bruce, and, you know, they were like celebrities to me, you know, still are, you know, like larger than life people, larger than life personalities, even in person. You know, just just surreal to be able to, you know, just drive an hour from my house and get to be a part of that. Yeah, so were you aware that, like, these are some big-time, big-deal musicians? Yeah. You know, like, would always listen to their cassettes or records and stuff at home, and it's like, you know, these guys are, you know, you know, like, they're, they're so famous, they got their own, you know, albums and all that, and, you know, to... A, Ten-year-old kid, that you know, seems huge. And I mean, they, you know, phenomenal musicians, and just seemed heavily con. You know, now that I look back, like there's such a heavy concentration of just amazing fiddlers and guitar players in the Midwest that you know, lucky I grew. I, lucky I grew up where I grew up, and got involved whenever I did. And some people, you know, would put up with me. Yeah. What's the best part about it? trick for doing that so they don't know you're doing it you've mentioned the apprentice program as a like when you were a student mm -hmm. and I understand you're also a, a master artist as well well that's debatable but uh, I have taught for them for the last or for three different years I've taught uh, first year I taught uh, my friend Bob Cathy and then the second second time that I done it, I actually taught his granddaughter. Yeah. And then uh, last the my last student was uh, Sophia Cunningham. And uh, everybody's gone on to you know play. And
what was that experience like being a um, teacher in this program that you were also a student in years ago or, uh, or an apprentice in years ago? It felt good. Like I, you know, fulfilled, you know, my obligation, you know, cause you know, the state of Missouri, uh, you know, has grants that they, they pay the master instructors to help pass these local traditions on. And, you know, I, I felt like I was, you know, fulfilling, you know, my end of the deal that I started whenever I was 15, you know, by, you know, not only did I learn, I'm now passing it on to others now. I've been in the master in the master's and apprenticeship deal two years in a row. Okay. Yeah. Um, when was that? Oh, uh, I don't remember when the first one was. I'm old. I can't remember dates. <laughs> uh, I taught Brad Roby. I had him my first one. I still got him more or less. He still comes out the house. We we play whenever we have a chance. And uh, Robert Mackey, it was the next one. And was, that was about three years ago, probably, wasn't it? Two, two, three years ago. Two years ago. And you were doing fiddle? No, I yeah. taught guitar. You were doing guitar. Yeah. Okay. And Robert really excelled on it. He he videoed everything, and he took it home and put it on the computer. He played it exactly the way we done it. Mm -hmm. But I mostly taught him fiddle tunes. I played the fiddle, and he had to play the guitar. He had the chords in front of him, and he, that's how he learned all that stuff. And I, I think that's a, a way to do it too, is put it on video. What was your experience like being a master master artist? I enjoyed it. Yeah, I enjoyed it. In time to get to play, I enjoy it. Probably more. I used to enjoy it more. <laughs> it's harder now. Yeah. Did you feel like you were um, kind of like John fulfilling this duty or? Well, yeah. Well, actually, we kind of worked together on that. Mm -hmm. He uh, he helped me, and I helped him too on this. We we were doing it together. How so? So we was two masters, and and he we, he'd do some of the fiddling. And, and yeah, we would meet at his house every weekend, and uh, you know, we uh, me and my uh, well, the two of my students, we we did that with, and uh, you know, I teach tunes in one room and he would be working with his guitar student in the other and then uh, you know I can teach fiddle tunes all day long but until they get to play them with backup you know they're just fiddle tunes nothing really comes together in a tune I don't at least in my experience you know <clears throat> until you're able to play with backup and like oh okay this is where everything fits and you know and then so the fiddle student would be able to have you know, the opportunity to play with, you know, one of the best backups in the country and, you know, have experience doing that. And then, you know, the guitar student would also be able to practice, you know, on a whim, a new tune that they hadn't heard yet. So. What are your overall thoughts about the future of this, this music in the, in the state? Do you feel optimistic about it? Do you have wavering feelings? Uh, trying to be optimistic about it but you know if it it seems like if it's not perfectly orchestrated contest style fiddling it's Appalachian round peak style which you know I like listening to all of it you know I'll listen to you know just about anything you know as long as it, but I really feel like you know what I, what we play is dwindling you, you know no matter how hard we're working to you know keep it going it's just you know everything's so accessible now too and you know everybody wants to play like they're at cliff top or they want to play like they're at weezer they don't want to play like they're at the boone county fairgrounds how about you kenny well like most of them anymore the younger generation is leaning more on the progressive style your Texas versions or Weezer version, rather play a lot more notes and junk in it instead of trying to play old time. 
there's few still playing old time. But uh, myself, I probably would never want to play anything but old time. Learn this from a Gary Lee Moore recording, fiddle player from Seattle. And then also from Clark Kessinger recording. And that's actually where Mr. Moore learned it from as well.